Even before the review, the government had set out its stall. The ambition, Boris Johnson told the Commons last December, to make the Royal Navy the foremost sea power in Europe. And speaking ahead of today's command paper, the head of the Royal Navy said it was entering a new era of rapid growth and real-world influence. So this is a rich decade where seven or eight different classes of ships and submarines are being built. The Navy tonnage from 2015 to 2030 increases by 50%. And that is allowing us to be strong in the Euro-Atlantic, be strong as a NATO partner, respond to some of the Russian activity that we're seeing, but also continue to be strong in the Gulf and also to reach out a bit more to the Indo-Pacific. So that's, for this, this, this review is about global Britain and my job as the head of the Navy is to provide the Prime Minister with a global Navy. Some broad details of what was coming we already knew. Today we saw the small print. The Navy's getting three new types of frigate to replace the ageing Type 23. Among them will be eight Type 26 anti-submarine ships, five Type 31 general purpose frigates, and a so far unknown number of Type 32s. These are likely to act as motherships for a new generation of unmanned systems. Two new types of submarines will also enter service, including four Dreadnought-class ballistic missile subs to replace the Vanguard class. The Royal Navy will also get three new classes of support vessels, including solid support ships and ocean surveillance. The Navy's strategic role is expected to shift too, with a new emphasis on forward presence provided by the UK's two new aircraft carriers and a smaller, leaner future commando force, allowing Royal Marines to take on missions traditionally done by UK Special Forces. There'll also be a greater Royal Navy presence in the Asia-Pacific region and in the North Atlantic, where Russia is increasingly flexing its maritime muscles. But there is, say some, a potential problem. Not all these new ships, the frigates in particular, will arrive before the old ones leave service in the mid-2020s. And that could see the Navy actually shrink before it grows. Two of the older Type 23 frigates are now beginning to show their age and do some fairly expensive maintenance. You couple that with how taut the Navy is for manpower then you can start seeing why losing a couple of older hulls early makes sense financially. Uh, the problem with that is, is if the jam tomorrow doesn't come, uh, and historically, of course, it hasn't, then actually all you're doing is losing hull numbers. And that's what's happened, certainly in my time in the Navy from the, from the early 90s. That's what's happened. That's why we're, our numbers are so low, which is why people like me, when, when you start offering up hulls early for something that hasn't happened yet, instinctively wince. It's thought the fleet could drop from 19 surface vessels to 17 or less before eventually rising to 24. But the head of the Navy doesn't think there'll be any capability gap. So we have 19 frigates and destroyers at the moment. We will look at the precise numbers as we go through this decade and we start growing up. And uh, as we start heading up to those higher numbers. And I can provide the same number of frigates and destroyers this year and next year as I did last year, and then the numbers start to increase. So we're going to be providing even more to the government to be able to fulfil their policies. The other question is crewing and how the Navy fulfils all these new roles, particularly when it's already 4% under strength. Of all the services, the Royal Navy's been the most obvious winner in recent spending announcements, but it's also being asked to do a lot more squaring government ambition with operational reality, now its biggest challenge. Simon Newton, Forces News. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.